Hey guys, this will be video 42 for the Vintage Gibson Les Paul Custom Restoration and this should be the last video related to this guitar. Uh, this is pro um, it's probably going to be around 35 to 45 minutes and I'm going to try to really keep myself on point and just keep it very casual. However, at the end of the video, I'm going to pause uh, the general conversation and I'm going to go into some pretty extensive detail about uh, how to pull the trigger on your drills and how to uh, lay out these uh, control locations. And I'll cover that later. So if you're interested in more of the hardcore technical stuff as to how I truly finish the guitar, then just hang out till the latter half of the video and I'll cover that. Uh, basically, this video series should, I mean, this video itself should have about five high points and uh, in order for me to just keep keep myself on point I'm just going to read through these. Um, I already mentioned that I'm going to do, be doing some pausing throughout the video. I have no idea how many times I'll pause, probably two or three times, maybe maybe four at the most. Um, but at the on the front 15 minutes of this video, I'm going to keep it real casual and very general because I'm also doing this video for the actual uh, owner of the guitar. I want him to see uh, where we are and and so that he can, um, you know, prepare to take receipt out because uh, it's pretty close to being able to put in the mail. I, I probably could have shipped it yesterday, if not the day before. Uh, but it's been cool to, to play it for about 48 hours to really work out the crickets. So uh, then I'm going to, and, and in this first 15 minutes of the video after the introduction, I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about what's in front of us. What's, what's the neck made out of? What's the overlay made out of? What's the fretboard made out of? What sort of not, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that if you're just tripping up on this last video and you're kind of intrigued by what you're looking at, uh, you'll be, you'll know what it is that you're looking at and that I'm discussing without having to go through 41 other videos because they were, they were almost torturous. There's a ton of information. And, uh, what else? Uh, I'm going to demo demonstrate some movable shapes. When I say movable shapes, I'm talking primarily uh, ninth chords, raised ninths. Uh, you know, we're lucky with the raised nine, and then like seventh chords and stuff like that. R real basic uh, jazz chords, blues chords, funk chords. And the reason I bring that up is because I've noticed that chords like that um, are really good for helping you. Uh, set the intonation on a guitar and you set the intonation by moving the little bridge saddles because the nut location is fixed the fret locations are fixed and the only thing that we can manipulate is the speaking length of each individual string in order to uh, ha whatever shape we play here if we move up to the higher register it still sounds harmonious or uh, has some sort of uh, basic tuning stability. Uh, the whole thing about the guitar, it's not perfect and it's almost impossible to get a perfect, I think it is impossible to get a authentically per perfect, perfectly intonated guitar, but um, it's not a synthesizer and no one that plays guitar uh, wants it to be, to sound that way. So. All right, let me stop going off the rails there. Uh, I'm going to discuss, uh, I think I may have mentioned that. I'm gonna, I'll be discussing uh, string spacing widths, uh, not widths, you know, string spacing down there. Because if there's two or three guys that are watching this video that are holding a mechanical pencil in their hand and they're getting ready to start drawing some lines on paper, uh, when I say lines, I'm talking about a trapezoidal path. I'm going to give you your starting starting point from where to start drawing all your lines. And then uh, I think I already mentioned at the end of the video, I'm going to talk about how to uh, lay out the controls to, to drill those locations because I made a bit of a mistake on the front end when I was uh, just uh, uh, 
demo and the guitar, the body, if you look at some of the first videos, the body was in really bad shape and only had one or two of the original locations. But I failed to make a tracing or measurement of those locations in relation to some hard fixed points. And it forced me to have to um, I locate them later on and uh, it wasn't the hardest thing in the world but it, it cost me about two to three hours worth of additional layout work and also I was the last thing I was going to cover would be uh, uh, my opinion of the valuation of a guitar like this or let me just back up this guitar um, let me let me keep it about this guitar because I don't think it would be fair to compare this guitar to a brand new Les Paul or a Murphy Lab Les Paul or a, uh, you know, or a, a 20 year old Les Paul or a 30 year old Les Paul. If you, my, my point is they're, they're going to vary, man, they're going to be all over the map. Uh, I had a, I think it was an early seventies. It might've been a late sixties Les Paul when I was uh, in my, uh, this was probably in the early 90s, and man, sometimes I, I wake up in, in a cold sweat thinking about losing that guitar, but then, because it was so, it's such an incredible guitar, but then, uh, and I've picked up Les Pauls that I couldn't, I couldn't give it, give it away. I just, uh, so they were all over the map, and that's not just about Gibson, that's, that's pretty much every guitar. So uh, I hope I didn't go off the rails there, but I guess what I'm saying, from a valuation standpoint, I'm going to be talking about this guitar. And from a standpoint of if someone walked into my storefront business and I'm in L.A. or I'm in uh, Austin or I'm in Atlanta, Nashville, New York, and someone walks in this shop and they're looking for... Um, truly professional instrument that they can go to Belmont with, you see my part, go to Berkeley with, and uh, that's where my numbers are going to be coming from because it's not so much that is it, is it pretty, is it shiny, is it this, that, and the other, um, what does it feel like, and what does it sound like, and this guitar feels like a $15,000 guitar, it's amazing. Uh, is it worth 15000 Nowhere near it. Uh, does it sound like a $10,000, dollars $15,000 guitar? All day long. Uh, I played a, a $13,000, roughly $13,000 Benedetto up at Gruen's about 10 years ago. This guitar plays just as good. Uh, now, his was a big body. Uh, that was a big body jazz guitar, but this guitar plays just as good. <clears throat> and it's just as articulate. And if this will tell you anything, this is this is really going to come off really funny. Um, about two hours ago, I found myself playing uh, like Hank Garland tunes. And I was playing Jingle Bells and all the Christmas stuff. And it was amazing. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was hilarious. And I never, I've never, I don't think I've ever played Jingle Bells. And I'll be, you know what, if I wasn't playing Jingle Bells a little while ago and it sounded just like the stuff Hank was doing uh, on the radio. So anyway, it's amazing how uh, a guitar will bring uh, certain styles out of you. Uh, I'll pick up a Strat and, and just within 15 seconds I'm playing uh, Johnny Guitar Watts and Funk, you know, and just, just as good as Johnny all day long. And you pick up a Gretsch and next thing I know I'm playing Brian Setzer. So it was really cool that this guitar brought the jazz, the true jazz guitarist out of me when I picked it up. So I, I it may sound like I went off the rails there, but I know that I'm presenting valuation. And that's what I meant by if someone walked into the shop and they're a jazz guitarist and they truly are a Hank Garland fan or a, you know, early Jimmy Page. I think Jimmy did a lot of session jazz work, which I've never heard any of. I'd love to trip up on that and find out what, what he really was as a guitarist or where he started. So, uh, and I'm going to try to reel this back in, but that's what I'm talking about, my valuation. 
if someone's walking in looking for a, a guitar that they can do true uh, studio session work or tour with a jazz ensemble, um, man, they, they, they'd be excited to pay five grand for this guitar or 4,500 for it. And they would never sell it. They just would never sell it. Um, so it is an heirloom and I'm not just saying this because I'm the one that did the restoration and I want to reel this back in, but I'm trying to drive this home so that if anyone's just interested in the general guitar, uh, or, or a general guitar like this, I, I hope that I will have covered some of those bases. So on that note, let me get back on point. Uh, and uh, what do I want to start talking about? Let me look at the time. We're at 10 minutes, and that's not too bad, because I feel like I covered a lot of real general stuff. And I may have mentioned that, uh, yeah, I mentioned I'm going to do some uh, some chord work later on. And I'm even going to discuss uh, different picks and um, if anybody in Nashville uh, knows Teflon Don, tell Teflon I said howdy. <laughs> and uh, Teflon gave me these uh, these guitar picks. He used to work the uh, uh, touring circuit a lot, and he would manage like the setup and the breakdown of pro professional artist uh, uh, concerts. And he would kept, come in uh, work on a Monday morning. He'd give me a guitar pick that was used you know, on like Saturday night show there in Nashville. And so in a little while, I'm going to do some playing with a Martina McBride pick, a Diamond Rio pick, and, and yep, this is Brad Paisley. Although I've worn his name off of it, it's a great pick. And then uh, I don't think this was Brian Setzer's, but it was someone who, uh, well, I don't know, maybe it was the, band that opened for in their socket. Anyway, this is, is a Gretsch pick. So we're, we're, we're going to, I'll do a little bit of demo with different picks and uh, I'm going to show you whoever plays for Martina McBride. I don't know if this was Martina's pick. I don't know if she plays guitar, but it, it won the race out of all these. This is a Planet Waves pick and it's a, it's, it's medium thick, probably like 0.7 something, maybe a little bit more unbelievable tones and I did some demo uh, recording a little while ago and uh, it doesn't come through on this phone recording nearly as clear as I had hoped it would but uh, man that the Martina McBride Planet Ways pick uh, pretty much blew them all away as far as smoothness and clarity on a maple neck Les Paul so Anybody's got any Martina McBride picks? Let me know. I'll buy them. <laughs> so, anyway, all right, let me get back on point. Let me just admit, I hope I didn't talk too long about that. 13 minutes. I guess I blew thir three minutes talking about Martina McBride. All right, so what I want to do, uh, let's just talk about the guitar. Uh, one thing I will say about Martina McBride, I, I heard that she was one of the only artists in Nashville that they did not have to auto-tune when she sung when she did uh, all of her recordings. So if that tells you anything about Martina McBride. She's the real thing. All right, what do we want to talk about? Um, I'll just show the guitar because you guys have not seen it in its finished state. I'm gonna do like a flyby. And I don't know if I talked about the lighting, but I changed this light bulb. It's a different bulb. I think it's more of a blue light. I think it's given a more authentic uh, view of the of the binding let me see if that makes it worse or better i kind of like having the white background and i'm sorry if this is erratic but i'm just doing the best i can so i'm just going to stop talking and just show the guitar this is all new binding i can't remember uh, yeah this is new uh, this this is original up to this point. This is new. I replaced this, replaced this all the way around to this point right here. Connected. I hope that's in the camera. Oh, it's a little bit, a little bit high. Sorry, knock my bulb off. Oh, connected somewhere up in here. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was looking back. Connected right here. This is original. 
So I say that to say this, I think we did a pretty good job matching our binding, making it look authentic. And then everything that's from the neck is obviously brand new, but um, tinted with a honey amber and a little bit of star cast and a little bit of maple and a little bit of my own custom mix. This is not just right out of the can. All right, so let me stop talking about that because I don't want to start wasting time. Uh, what else do I want to discuss for the owner, maybe? Um, I have this guitar strung up with, uh, per the owner's request, uh, these are, he wanted a super light string, which I don't play super lights. Let me see if that's in the camera. That should be a pretty good view. Oh man, I think I just hit that tuner. I'm going to try to make sure I keep it in tune. Uh, I'm strung up with Diodario uh, Super Lights, and these are EXL 120. And they go 9, 11, 16, 24, 32, 42. Uh, way too light for me as a jazz and rockabilly player. Uh, I get really aggressive because sometimes I'm doing almost like a punk esque rockabilly and uh man the, the the these strings are just way way too light for that type of playing but again as i mentioned earlier uh this thing had me playing jingle bells a little while ago so and the, and i'm not i'm not saying that be to be funny that's that's pretty cool that this guitar had me playing authentic jazz so because it, it required that i play with a very gentle delicate articulate light touch uh these are nickel wounds and, and man, it sounds incredible. That's what it's set up for. Uh, and if you changed over to a heavier string, you're going to have to have a little bit of uh, adjustment, and it'll need to be done by a pro. But right now, I've got it set up for these nines, and it plays really good. It sounds good. I've got the Gibson USA surrounds mounted. It should be in the camera, and they got all the you know appropriate screws. Everything's set. I'll show this. I don't know if it will show up. Let me just get behind the camera. Yeah, that's a pretty good view. I'm gonna show it upside down. So they they look very nice. These were these were non-curved backs, but uh, they it it followed the curvature quite well. And I'm not gonna start talking about stuff like that. That's a waste of time. But we got a clue on. Uh, I think this is called the Pinnacle Bridge. And right now, I'm, I'm about 95% intonated. Uh, I'm struggling getting these intonated because I'm not used to intonating a super light gauge string. So I'm not there yet, but I'm getting close to the intonation. Um, and I'll go ahead and talk about this just on the surface, but uh, we've got, I've got these drilled per, uh, uh, per the original specifications. And uh, I guess I'll go ahead, I don't know if I've even shown the back yet. Really nice. I'll do a flyby, do a pass through. I'll do a stop. I'll do a bank. Beautiful. Just, just positively beautiful. And you can kind of see that vintage amber showing up. All right, what do I want to talk about? Let me turn it this way just so you can see. Because if I'm watching a video like this, I, I would be thinking, oh man, I wish you could have shown the, you know, from the other angle. Or... Seven degree headstock angle. That's per vintage 55 specs. I think the 75 to 82 Gibson probably would have been uh, 15 or 16 degrees. It might have been 16 degrees. I uh, almost digress there. What was I going to talk about? or I should say I almost lost my train of thought. Just the vintage amber, uh, I guess it's kind of what I'm covering. And uh, let me see, let me think for a second. What would I want to show the client? I don't think there's anything that we would, we would that was uh, left undiscussed. This would be probably something that uh, we never really, let me, I'm gonna quieten down because I'm behind the camera, it gets a little bit loud. Yeah, okay.
I'm using that light to highlight the transition. And the cool thing about this, I'm telling you, if you brought this guitar to me and I'm 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 working for one of the, the big five, you know, in Nashville, Atlanta, Austin or LA, man, I would be I would really have a hard time determining that this neck was replaced. Uh and if you told me that it was replaced, I'd say prove it. I, you, you, if you show me some videos, but I would, I would, I'd really struggle. This this turned out incredibly well, and um, so there you have it. Um, all right, what else should I talk about? Let's uh, let me see. If, I think what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pause the video, and I'm gonna look at my list and think about how I want to proceed through the rest of the video even though i'm only at 20 minutes uh, i want to make certain that the next uh 10 to 20 minutes really covers what uh rick the owner would need to see or hear versus what the general youtube uh, public would want to uh see or hear and then we'll go from there so let me pause the video and i'll be back momentarily Okay, I think what I've decided, I'm going to cover the general specifications of the guitar, and this probably shouldn't shouldn't take more than five minutes or so. Uh, I'm just going to kind of go robotic here and talk about what's sitting in front of us. Uh, this is a 1975 to 1982 uh, Gibson Les Paul Custom. It uh, has it was originally shipped with a three piece maple neck, and that's what I rebuilt. The, the new neck out of this is this is the original neck so it and I had mentioned in one of the videos it looked like it had been in a tornado or something like that and then uh, the owner and I we were talking one night and we kind of started joking about where you know where what happened and then it hit me out of the blue I thought, you know what some some you know what idiot probably destroyed this guitar on stage and they probably took the guitar by the neck and hit the stage with the body, which destroyed the lower valve of the body, and then maybe they were holding it up high and it, and it broke up here. And that's the only thing I can figure. But that's where that's where we started. Three piece maple, ebony fretboard, and uh, low wide frets, uh, authentic mother of pearl inlay, which is. Uh, pretty much uh, replicated. The maple that I use is a, a bird's eye, which guarantees, I always like using bird's eye because it guarantees that I, that if I order the maple online, then it would guarantee that I get a hard maple. A lot of people out there don't realize there's a very big difference between like big leaf maple, which is softer versus like a true uh, Northern uh, maple bird's eye and uh like a white maple so i don't want to start talking about that stuff but um this was bird's eye maple that i had had for i think about four or five months and uh maybe longer but it had acclimated to my shop and i knew it was trustworthy so bird's eye maple which is rock maple uh gabon ebony fretboard quarter inch thick a bone nut, authentic bone nut, bone nut, uh, pre-slotted um, for Gibson. This is a Gibson Les Paul nut, which required almost no shaping. I think I, I sh yeah, I did. I shortened it just a little bit on its height, and it was ready to rock. Uh, these are all authentic 19, 1970s to 1980 tuners. Gibson, and then you probably may recall from some of the videos where I really drove home the importance of let's uh, let's go with the authentic tuners because they had the 90 degree tab. So we got them, and uh, thanks to the guy off of Reverb that the client bought them from, uh, got a fair deal, I think, and um, all's well. Uh, this is Vulcan Fiber uh, Overlay that was provided to me uh, by the owner. And this is authentic uh, mother of pearl, and uh, sounds incredible. Uh, it was epoxy. Yeah, I was kind of thinking about should I go into this detail. This being Vulcan fiber, 
you got to be real careful about gluing this to the maple or if your lower was mahogany you wouldn't i wouldn't recommend using like a tight bond for fear of possibly creating a rubber gasket so i used a t88 epoxy and i spent a lot of time talking about that in order to make certain that the uh tonal the tap tones of the of the overlay to the lower and all that jazz becomes one unit functioning as one unit so uh, optimal tone out of that right there i may have already mentioned i'm just going to cover it again a uh, gabon ebony fretboard with uh, authentic mother of pearl and this mother of pearl came from stuart mcdonald so it guaranteed that it was precision uh, precision dimensions and it is beyond stunning it's a beautiful beautiful pearl very balanced very 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 authentic uh, and the, because the mother of pearl does not have any amber or it doesn't have any uh, in other words since the fretboard does not have any uh, lacquer on it your binding is always going to remain white on the top but your headstock your headstock would be you know uh, would get the 40-year tint from cigarette smoke and cigarette or I always call this funny I say cigarette and I notice oh man I need to I need to start articulating in cigarette cigarette <laughs> but in the south we call I guess we call them cigarettes <laughs> anyway uh, from your bar you got your barfly tent from all the cigarette smoke beer and sweat and all that jazz uh, turn out really nice all right I need to uh, continue with the uh, specs these frets let me see where it is in the video uh, these frets are a Jeskar I like using the Jeskar it's a very good fret I get them from uh, oh wow Philadelphia Luthiers I buy them off of eBay it's got really good prices and these are These frets are Jeskar FW47104 12-inch radius, and I'll stop talking about that. The strings that we used, I may have already mentioned it, uh, I'm not certain. These are uh, Diodario nickel wound. The client wanted a light gauge, super light gauge string, so I put 942s on there. I usually run a 10 to 46 or even up uh, higher than that. So. Uh, in other words, it's set up with nines, and that's a very light, that's a very, very light string setup. And um, there you have it. I don't think there's any sense in talking about this stuff. I believe I've already covered this, and uh, it is what it is. So what I'm going to do is, uh, let me look at my list here and see if I should just let the video continue to run as I set up for this next section. Yeah, because this next section, I'm just going to move into, uh, let me, let me make, I think I might have forgotten something. I mentioned um, that the, I'm just going to read off my notes here. The nut finished out 1 and 11 16th of an inch, just, just a very, very thin hair thicker than 1 and 11 16th. If you put your calipers on it, it's it's basically one eleven sixteenths, so that's that's factory original. The string spacing from the center of the low E to the center of the high E, the string spacing is one and thirteen thirty seconds. You'll have to convert it to metric. I didn't have time. Uh, the string spacing at the bridge is exactly two inches from the center. From the center of the low E string to the center of the high E string is two inches. So we're, we are a 24 and three quarter inch scale. So if you guys are sitting there with a piece of paper and mechanical pencil, that's your trapezoidal path. I'm going to repeat it in case I might have said the wrong thing. Uh, one and 13 30 seconds down to two inches over 24 and three quarter inch uh, scale. And that's what the whole guitar would be designed around. We're looking, I'm looking at just slightly over, uh, I don't think I measured it. I didn't, I didn't, if I, I remember measuring it, but I didn't write it down. So bear with me for a second. 
I had mentioned in, I'm sorry, I got my head in the, I had mentioned in one of the videos, if not on two different occasions, your minimum string space off the top edge of the string, the, the minimum um, clearance you want is an eighth of an inch. If, it, if that string, let me see if this will show up on the camera. See, if that string gets over too far and you, you reach up, you run the risk of pushing that string off the fretboard. It's, it's far more critical down on the high E string. If the high E string is real close to the edge and you're doing hammer on work and you'll, you'll, you'll pull the string off the fretboard. So you got to have a minimum of one eighth of an inch. And this is just ever so slightly, uh, I think it's, it's a little bit more. Uh, it's not quite five thirty seconds of an inch, but it is over an eighth, but it is not three sixteenths of an inch. All right, so I'm going to stop because that's way, way too technical for this video. And uh, But I wanted to clarify that because if someone was sitting there really hoping for a critical dimension, I have not given those dimensions out yet. So if you need it, rewind the video. Critical dimensions are there, and I just checked my notes. I didn't misspeak and say the wrong thing. Those are, are those are safe to build a guitar by. All right, I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to pause the video, and I'm going to uh, probably be removing this uh, cover on the back, and we're going to start talking about laying out the uh, control pots. So yeah, let me pause the video. Okay, guys, I'm going to finish up the video uh, discussing primarily uh, drilling, locating and drilling the uh, tuner. I mean, the, my gosh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to think of how I should approach this. This is really de detailed. The volume and tone pots, uh, locating them on a virgin surface and making certain that you hit them within just... Uh, as precise as possible and I, I nailed this one on the head uh, it turned out really well um, I'll show you the back this this is our target that's let me look in the video let me just get behind the camera okay so that that's our that's our objective and we had a flat surface we know that and all of this was new, and hopefully you know that. But how do we, the question is, how do we go about finding those points? Let me do this. Let me set this right here and uh, just show you what we had. All right, when I first got the body, uh, I was able to slide this through all the damaged area and lay it. In other words, this was the guitar. I laid this down and was able to trace all of that location right there. And if you looked at it from, then I traced it on another piece of paper and I cut it out. I, I wanted to make certain that I had, uh, I was considering using it as a painting shield. And, uh, but then I got there and thought, no, I might use that at the very end to um, locate everything, which I did. I flipped it over and this became the front and so this would be the front of the guitar and now we got to figure out where to put it okay so that that's our objective and what else do we have we have a very very rough sketch uh, this was looking at it from the the back and I reached in with a pencil so the only location I truly had was the bridge master volume. This is looking at it from the back. I had the bridge master volume, but the top was warped. It had broken loose and separated and warped, and this was actually lower than factory. So in, in its original location, it should have been about an eighth of an inch higher. And I knew all of that couldn't really be trusted. But uh, neither here nor there, I went ahead and traced it anyway, but I tried to always keep a mental note of don't think that you can just go lay that on the top and drill the hole. 
which I couldn't. So this was where I started doing some of my final engineering. Again, this is going to be really technical. And, and if you're not into geeking out, uh, you might want to check out because the video is not going to get very uh, romantic from here on out. All right. So what we've got, we've got this one whole location right here, which we know is wrong. We've got it, but it's wrong. And we could uh, take a, a guess and try to rework it, but odds are we'd probably miss by an eighth of an inch. So I just cut it out, replaced the top, and knew that we would figure it out on the tail end. How did I figure out the engineering? I went online and tried to take a, a chance by going on the forums and asking, you know, what is what is the location of the center of this uh, neck volume? See, this would be the I'm sorry, let me let me back up a little bit. Okay, we're looking at the front of the guitar. Okay, follow me. That's the uh, tail piece. And what I needed to know, I needed to know from the center of that point, the center of that uh, anchor, to the center of this first uh, potentiometer, which is the neck volume. If you give me that dimension, I'll I'll, I'll, that's all I needed. I could not find that. There was no one that understood, you know, or let me put it this way. There was no generic information out there that clarified that. And um, how I did find it was the fact that I knew uh, – I'm going to have to rely on the actual control cavity and I'm going to have to start from the back and move forward. So in other words, I couldn't find that information. And how did it, how did I determine it to make certain that I hit those spots? Uh, I may be digressing a little bit here, but I think if I don't, I may forget to cover this. All right. So I had a flat surface, right? meaning a, a, a non-drilled surface. Front, bottom, bottom, inside. Okay, so I knew I had that right there, and I knew it was spot-on accurate. Now bear with me. I don't know if this is in the camera. I don't really have time to stop. So I had that flat surface, and I'm thinking, hmm, okay, well, probably one of the most important things is that the if I'm, well, I'll show it on the guitar. It's easier to see. If I'm looking at this from the back, let me just go ahead and slide one in. They're pretty tight intentionally. Uh, it was very important to me. I haven't even done this yet, so you, you'll get to see. Is it on the camera? Yeah, that should, this, this, this should end up being a good video, especially for the, the tech guys. Um, that was pretty tight. Bear with me. Let me. Uh, I don't want to. I can. I can. I cannot damage the guitar. Period. Okay. Those are kind of difficult to push through sometimes. We'll talk about the front in a little while. All right. Sorry for the chaos, but we're back. I knew that was critical. That when you open that cover, that these hit. Let me just get behind the camera. I knew it had to look like that and, and it couldn't be fake. And I didn't want to come in here and, and do this uh, bastard drilling and then fill these holes up on the front full of epoxy and file them and sand them. I wanted to hit this the first time. And this is the first time I've seen it. I, I have not put those in yet. Um, and how did I hit that the first time? You, uh, all right, let me, let me see, let me, uh, let me take these out, and you have to start with a 1 16th of an inch drill bit, and a little block that you know is going to force you to drill a perfectly perpendicular uh, pilot hole. I'm talking about doing pilot hole. I'm, I'm transferring I'm talking about transferring the very center of that location to the front, 
which the front is a about as compound radius of a platform as you can get. It's an arch top. So if I've got this little shield in here, well, I got to figure out where the, the, the center of each of these little uh, circles would be. Okay, now we're going to get to move into uh, getting more of a, a guaranteed uh, constant. And how I did that was I flipped it back over to my clean side. And you need to drop by Office Depot or some shop like that and get a professional combo circle template. And then you just find what this, which one it is. Doesn't matter. I don't care if it's one and three eighths or one and a quarter. It looks like it's one and a quarter. So again, this is technical and don't expect this to be entertaining. Um, so I found that it is a one, one, one and one quarter inch circle. And I made certain that I drew, drew that circle. I drew that circle there and I drew that circle there. And then I found the center of those two circles. And then I asked myself, can I trust that one? I met, look what would have happened. See where that circle is in relation to that, uh, at that actual opening? I would have been wrong. If I had have just said, okay, well, it's, you just go up to each corner, then you drill a hole. No, I would have missed it by a quarter of an inch and would have destroyed the, the project. I knew I couldn't trust this down here because I wasn't exactly sure where it was, but I knew it was pretty close. All right, here's, here's where we start doing our reverse engineering. I had these two points right here. I drew a straight line. Okay, once I, once I found the center, and let me think for a second. Yeah, I went ahead and drew a straight line. And then I went online and I verified through multiple, multiple sources that the information I had was trustworthy. And I... I determined that by going from the center of either either one of either this circle or this circle here, I could come up here and whatever the, the, the dimension was, I don't remember, it doesn't matter, but I, ma I made an arc, okay? And I, and I felt confident that I had that arc point right there. And then I came over here and... I verified that from, in other words, I, I, I found the dimension, um, I'm just, we'll, we'll say it was 50 millimeter or 55 millimeter. I can't remember what it was. I set my compass at 55 millimeter or 50 millimeter and I made an arc. And then I came over here and I determined that the online information said that from the center of this circle over to that is, we'll say 90 millimeter. So I set my compass at 90 and then I made my mark. Okay, so guess what I got? I just landed the center of that circle. Now I can draw, uh, now I can determine uh, where, the, the, where, the, where the big uh, circle should be. And then, does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. And I, hope, I don't feel like I'm being too technical. But then I made that circle. Did I need that circle? No, not really, but it helped me to, to know that it was there and it kept me on point. And then guess what? Once I had this, I could do the same thing for this uh, location down here. I don't care if that's volume, tone, or, or what, it doesn't matter. All I'm doing is finding, I'm finding, uh, I'm finding centers of circles. So we'll say this one was 48 or 49, and I think that was roughly it. And then I came down off of this circle, which I knew was true. And what's really cool, I even verified that the center of this circle to the center of that circle was in fact 95 millimeter. And then, I, so that was really making me feel good about knowing that these two points were correct. And then I found that this was, I think 49. And then I made an arc right there. And we'll say this was 75. They don't trust these numbers. I'm just grabbing numbers out of the air. And then I set my compass and I made I made that arc. Let me slow down. I made that arc. And then once I had that arc and that arc, then I knew I had this point. And then I then I took my uh, 
straight edge and I took my straight edge and I literally measured from the center of this. Okay. Let me, let me identify these. This will be, we're looking at it from the front. This is the volume, the volume for the neck, the volume for the bridge, the tone for the neck and the tone for the, the bridge. So by going on, looking at all of my online information, they gave me multiple checkpoints that I could verify that the center, the dimension there from that, that pot to that pot was correct. I hit that and then I was able to verify this was perfect. I already knew this was perfect. Once I had one or two that were factoring in perfect, the odds were every one of these dimensions were going to be perfect. Okay, so that was kind of long-winded, but critical because now, now that I had these, uh, now that I had these little points, what 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 was it time to do? It was time to take a pen and take a pen and just punch through the paper, okay, at, at each one of these, and then take that piece of paper. try to keep them scratching the body and then put that back in our newly renovated guitar cavity Let's see if that's on the camera and then take a real sharp nail or, or something very precise don't try to use anything like this because you can't you can't get in there straight it's got to be straight and what honest to God what I used was a three inch screw a deck screw that has a precision point on the end and then I put that up there on that point and I took my hammer and I just tapped it once you tap it once don't tap it three times all I want to do is find and I did all four obviously and you and then you remove your remove your cover and you're sitting there look, looking at four little points. Now you're going to take your drill pad, drill press, and you're going to put a sixteenth inch drill bit in your drill press. I'm going to set. Well, I'm going to have to hold this. And you're going to set this block up on your drill press. You're going to. You, you're. This is your little helper. This is going to guarantee that you don't screw up when you're transferring through five eighths of an inch thick piece of maple that you transfer a perfectly centered hole back here to the front. There's no way, and you know what, that you can do that by hand. It ain't gonna happen, so don't try it. You, you try that, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna regret it. You're gonna have to have a little block. I like poplar, because I know it's nice and flat and square. And I put this on my drill press, and I drilled a few little holes. You know, and then guess what? I was able to put that in my handheld drill and set this down there. Okay, let me, let me explain this. And it's amazing. Uh, a lot of you guys are going, we know that. We all know that. It, I don't care if every one of you know it. If there's only one person out there that doesn't know it, this is going to blow your mind. You, you've you got your drill, right, connected. And then you just take that in there and you look down and you get it on the point. And then you, you, you just maybe start turning your drill in reverse. And you make certain that you didn't screw up your little point. And then you turn your drill in reverse until the little block goes down and settles down. And then guess what? I feel 100% confidence that if I pull the trigger on that drill, when I when I come through the whether I'm cutting that one, that one, or maybe I can't get that to fit up there, maybe I go to this different corner. I'm sorry, this is a little chaotic, but I'm trying to hold the you know what thing. And it's, anyway. So maybe, maybe you're going to use this side to get up into that point. So regardless, after you've shot those four locations, you've transferred those uh, two-dimensional points from the, the back up to the front. Now you can start asking yourself, uh, does it look right? Does it look correct? That's all that matters because right now you can – you got a little drill bit that you could stick through and you can start putting your uh, uh, control knobs in place and ask yourself, well, is it correct? Well, it's as, cl it's, it's, 
if it's not correct, and bear with me here, um, it, it, you, you, could, you don't really have much room. If, if this one's not correct, well then, man, you're going to be within us. You're going to be within one millimeter. Okay. Because you sure as hell aren't going to move it up a quarter of an inch or in a quarter of an inch or out a quarter of an inch. What I'm saying is you've used this actual cavity in order to transfer what's real and we don't really care what's going on online because a 1959 Les Paul, man, they may be a quarter of an inch further down this way or, or an eighth of an inch down this way. Don't, don't try to start changing gears. Work with what's in front of you. So, all right, so there we are. We're sitting there looking at these four little points. And this is where it starts getting a little bit tricky. And let me see if I can explain this without... Um, going all over the map here. All right, so we've got our point. Let me, let me I'm just going to think here for a second. Once I, once I had those points, I knew, yeah, once I had those points, I knew that I was able to uh, take my push pins. Let me think for a second. Yeah, I had four little bitty holes and then bottom inside. So this is the front and this is the bottom. I was able to take a push pin, see what I'm saying? I was able to go through each one of those holes and, and because I had drawn the round circle, I was able to take this whole guitar and just lean it up on my other table and I was able to take a visual. Now there, it's going to fall because the holes are already 3 eighths of an inch, but I was able to step back and go spot on looks great man i mean it's a les paul all day long other than the fact um uh, that was my that was the center of the bottom location that was not the center of the top and because the top is there's nothing it's not even on a flat plane everything about it is compound radius i knew i was at a point now it's like okay i'm halfway there halfway there this is good I got my little points what do I do now I came in with tape and I had these points like that right there we'll, let me see if I can find a pen I don't think I got a pen I'm just gonna hit it with a marker where's the hole okay so so I had the had these little holes right and then what I did after that I knew that the next thing I was about to do is take this drill bit because I trust it and I know it's unbelievably precise and I was going to have to, each one of these holes, I'm going to exaggerate, each one of these holes was going to be on a different pitch and a different slope and this one up here was going through more material so I had to anticipate it possibly being drilled down a little bit more or on a little bit more of an angle but not much. Uh, this one had to be angled like this. This one had to be angled like that. That one had to be angled to the front. And this one had to be angled about like that. How in the, you know what, do you do that? You can take quarter inch sockets from a, a, a ratchet set and you can lay those up there. And that is, a, if this control knob was this big, I would I would be able to come through. Let me see if I can just make a small hole. That socket, I'm going to hold it with my left hand. Why? Because I had already drawn a small hole circle around there and I knew that was the center. That's where I needed to hold that socket. Okay. And, 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 uh, it just is because I knew if I had that outside line up, whatever I drilled through the center was going to allow me to drill centered. So let me see if I can pick up the pace here a little bit. Um, but I needed it to pass through. So I'll, let's see if I did. Yeah, I think, no, I did do it this way. This guaranteed that I followed center. 
And if you're still here, that's cool. You get a gold star because I know most guys would be checking out by now. This is pretty, you know what, boring. When I pull the trigger on that drill, as long as I know that that drill bit doesn't do this crap right here, I'm good. I'm going to I'm going to drill through that location and I'm going to be within a 64th of an inch. I'm going to be close enough that even if I did have to take the file and do a little bit of encouragement, I can do it now. And then when I move to this one, completely forget what I just did on the line. I'm sorry. I would put that location right there and I would kind of look at it and ask myself, well, does it need to lean this way or does it need to lean that way or that way? No, it's pretty obvious. It needs to kick back and lean kind of like that, but then cocked on a little bit of an angle that way. So take the drill bit. Set it right there on that little little point that I had created with my little little bitty nail, and then uh, do the same thing. Hold that hold that socket real nice and light, and just put that bit in the center. Pull the trigger and go straight through. Repeat and rinse. Repeat and rinse. And just so that's how you get that location. We're not out of the woods yet because. Now we've got to take this little bitty hole, and man, I, I'll be the first one to tell you this is this is nerve wracking to keep it from uh, to keep it from traveling within that area. And what you've done, uh, all this tape, what you've you've got this you've got this. Uh, I, I don't really have time to do it because I don't want this uh, to get too long. I'll, I'll just I'll just exaggerate. You got that location right there that you're beginning to you're gonna run you're gonna run this bit through it first and and you're on that whole angle thing and then you're gonna you're gonna have to stop it about right there and then you're gonna come in I'm, I'm gonna check the time on the camera man we're at 56 minutes but just bear with me guys it's a long video then we're gonna come in with the quarter inch and we're gonna be real confident this is when you gotta really be confident and we're gonna we're going to run through that same path. We're not out of the woods yet. We're going to come in with a stepped bit that we really trust. This is a quarter. This is five sixteenths. The third step is three eighths of an inch. Three eighths is our target. So we've got to take it on down, right? And now guess what? We've, we've gone through our tape. We, now, I only took that off so that you can see it. But you need to leave that tape on there because you're not out of the woods yet. Let's see how that's on an angle. Isn't that cool? It shows you that it's going through the right angle and then after we've got that 3 8 inch step now we're gonna really we're really gonna sh sh show how confident we are we're gonna take our handheld drill and we're gonna set that that cowboy right there in place and we're gonna pull the trigger on a drill and and we are going to set the clutch so that as soon as it hits that maple it'll hang and it'll start clutching and then we're going to put it in reverse and back out and then we're going to set that clutch maybe a little bit stronger or maybe we're just going to set the speed up real fast and we're going to ease into that hole to the point to where look how tight that is and if you look at these if i was if i had four three eighths inch bits you'd see every one of them are pointing on a on a, on a different direction why because it's exaggerated out here but it's critical it's critical down here because of this right here. Let me see if I just, I don't have any Les Paul knobs. The Les Paul top hat knobs, they're pretty big. They're probably one one inch or like the speed knobs. I think the speed knobs are seven eighths of an inch. But basically you'll see that every one of these knobs are gonna hit like that right there. So I'm gonna try to end the video right there because I really don't want this to go over, over an hour. We're at 59 minutes right now. But um, it's finished as far as my job is concerned. The only thing I've got to do, uh, I want to leave that on there because it's really attractive. Um, and if I had, if I had, if, if the video hadn't, I mean, if it hadn't gone so long, I would have gone ahead and put these in there and showed you how you can adjust the height and all that jazz and then, you know, put this little knob on there. But we, we just, we don't have time for that. But what I am going to do, is this and explain to you that I'm going to come in with a Q-tip with some black lacquer 
black nitro and I'm going to seal that wood so there will be no unfinished surfaces in this guitar at all and I'm going to hope that I hit pretty close to the location and try to clean the table up a little bit even if I have to just throw stuff to the side because I want the very last picture in this video series to be attractive and encouraging to those of you that are doing this type of work or have a guitar that you want to restore and by now if you follow the whole series you get a gold star for certain this is this has been a, a mind-numbing <laughs> restoration let's just slide that out. but uh see if we can see if we can jack, jack it up a little bit with the with the wildcat fur and and the block and take a Take a visual of that, and then I'm going to spin the body around. And, ah. Close enough for rockabilly. Looks good. All right. Thanks, guys.